Hello everybody, right now this is Dr. Alex Vasquez coming to you live and we are going to talk about the risks of nutrient toxicity using the antiviral nutrition protocol. I'm just going to show you some examples here. I think these are some of the more common examples. If I were your teacher and you were my student and I were asking you uh, how to competently manage this program, these are the questions that you would find in your exam. So let's go through these. Skillful use of any therapeutic protocol requires proper patient selection, intervention, and customization. So we don't just throw the same protocol at everyone. And after we give them or prescribe the protocol, we have to manage it and monitor for efficacy or toxicity or whatever changes might occur in what we commonly call the clinical picture. So we manage patient status, any disease progression or maturation, because some diseases might look like disease A for the first month, and then later it starts to look more like disease B, and so maybe our diagnosis was wrong, or maybe we have another disease developing while we were treating the first disease. Iatrogenic toxicity is what I'm gonna focus on in this presentation right now especially when the toxic dose is also close to the therapeutic dose. That's a very important uh, circumstance in which we really need to know what we're doing. So, you know, sometimes with nutrition, generally speaking with nutrition, we have what's called a wide therapeutic window, which is the effective dose, let's say down here, let's say the effective dose uh, is whatever units it is, 100 units or 10 units or whatever. And let's say the toxic dose is 10,000 units of whatever, milligrams, micrograms, etc. But usually we have what's called again here in pharmacology a wide therapeutic window. We can treat them with a effective dose and that's very far. We have a lot of distance between the effective dose and the toxic dose. With some nutrients, we don't have a wide window. We have a very narrow therapeutic window when the toxic dose is the therapeutic dose and the therapeutic dose is the toxic dose. So in those situations, we need to be at uh, an expert level and be on our game, as the saying goes. If you're a clinician treating patients with this protocol or any protocol, then you have to be fluent with the potential toxicities and how to monitor for each of these. So this is true whether you're using nutrients, vitamins, minerals, amino acids, botanicals, and or drugs. If you're using all of those together, then you have to be fluent in all of those. You've got to know the drugs, you've got to know the minerals, the vitamins, the diet, your patient's status, especially in terms of liver and kidney function, etc. So you know, these are the reasons why clinicians have to study and be very competent in each aspect of what they do. So we're going to look at these interventions. I've just selected a few, not really at random, but some representative examples of interventions that we might use. We need to look at these from a clinical standpoint in terms of their toxicity. The reason for that is because that's how patients present. They present clinically. They don't come in with laboratory results saying, hey, read these laboratory results to me. I think I've got a problem. They come in and they say, gosh, since last time I saw you, I feel better or I feel the same or I feel worse or I feel different. And in some cases, what we're looking for is what is that different and what does it fit in terms of the patterns we have in our heads when we undergo this process of pattern recognition, what can we match their symptoms to? And you'll see how that plays out here. So after we have suspicion of a potential toxicity, then of course we need to know how to test for it. And I'll show you how to do that in just a moment. So we're going to talk about a few select interventions here. We'll talk about the potential clinical presentations of toxicity and we'll talk about how to analyze those from a laboratory perspective. So diving into this, let's start with vitamin D. What's the clinical presentation of vitamin D toxicity? So if you're using nutrition in your practice, you might reasonably be expected to know these things. Typical vitamin D toxicity presents with weakness, nausea, vomiting, uh, 
and polyuria, which just means excessive urination. Usually that's secondary to the hypercalcemia, and that's how we test for vitamin D toxicity. So you can look at vitamin D levels, either 25-hydroxyvitamin D or 125-dihydroxyvitamin D, that's fine. You probably should, as a clinician, look at those periodically, at least at the initial evaluation, so you know kind of where your patient is in that spectrum. And then we follow up by looking at uh, calcium levels if we are concerned about vitamin D toxicity. Obviously, if you're concerned about vitamin D toxicity, then you might reasonably look again at 25-hydroxyvitamin D, 125-dihydroxyvitamin D, because that clinical picture can change as well over time. If, if a disease was present that you didn't know about, like let's say the patient has tuberculosis, or sarcoidosis and you didn't know it and you put them on vitamin D and now their clinical picture is changing uh, through no fault of your own you could have unmasked an underlying problem and now your patient's got hypercalcemia and they come into your office feeling a little weak when you expect them to feel better so this is within the range of things that we as clinicians have to deal with uh, I think that's a reasonably competent conversation quick as it is on vitamin D toxicity. Presentation, weakness, nausea, vomiting, polyuria. Uh, you know, other conditions present in the exact same way. That's why we take a clinical presentation and then we do labs if we don't know the answer. If a patient comes into your office with weakness, nausea, vomiting, and polyuria, that could easily be the same presentation, for example, as acute type 1 diabetes. Weakness, nausea, vomiting, polyuria, perfection. That's, that's a classic presentation for type 1 diabetes. That's not necessarily a classic presentation for something like infectious diarrhea. So let's say your patient has infectious diarrhea. They present with weakness, nausea and vomiting due to electrolyte loss, for example, or dehydration. But they wouldn't present with polyuria if they're dehydrated. They would have oligouria or anuria. So that's how we as clinicians have to think about these things. Let's look at vitamin A. So with vitamin A, the therapeutic dose is very close to the toxic dose. So here's where we have to be on our game. So I typically teach this to students or to conference attendees. I teach them to think of this as 3 times 2 equals 6. That's an easy way to kind of establish some intellectual shelves upon which we're going to put this information. So we've got three areas. Each one contains two ideas or two books on your intellectual bookcase. So pain is headache and body pain. So I put body pain. Sometimes it could be abdominal pain, especially if they have liver toxicity. It could be uh, right upper quadrant pain. But the reason I put body pain is sometimes it's described as bone pain. Sometimes it's described as joint pain. So I just put body pain. Dry skin and hair loss. So dry skin means dry skin on their body, but also chapped lips. That's a classic presentation, uh, and also hair loss. So you've got two times two here. You've got two categories, each with two items, headache and body pain. So that's, those, that's the pain category. The skin category is dry skin and hair loss. And then we go to labs, and then we're going to look for elevated triglycerides and indication of hepatic congestion. So the toxicity of vitamin A is liver toxicity, manifesting as hepatic congestion. The labs that we use for monitoring uh, or diagnosing what we think might be hepatic congestion, we use um, an assay for a, an enzyme called gamma glutamyl transferase and also total bilirubin. So if you see elevations in GGT or, and or bilirubin, you might start thinking, this could look like hepatic congestion. Oh yes, this patient's been on vitamin A for three months or six months, and maybe the dose is obviously too high for them. Or maybe they have another liver disease, and they couldn't tolerate a normal dose of vitamin A. So if a patient, for example, is alcoholic, and they've hidden that from you, and you put them on a reasonable dose of vitamin A, they could develop liver toxicity earlier than you expect, and maybe your assessment of the patient was correct, maybe your dose of vitamin A was correct, but they developed liver toxicity because they lied to you about their alcoholism. That's a possibility. 
And doesn't necessarily have to be that scenario. It doesn't have to be that they lied. Maybe they've got hepatitis C, they didn't know about it. Or they've got hepatitis B, they didn't know about it. Or they have hemochromatosis, one of the most common genetic disorders in the Caucasian population, and they didn't know about it. And now, because of the vitamin A, we have collectively unmasked a previously undiagnosed problem. Zinc. What is the expected toxicity of a reasonable dose of zinc for example, as one might use in my antiviral nutrition protocol. The expected toxicity of zinc is nothing. Zinc is not toxic at the doses that I typically recommend. However, we could induce copper deficiency and the presentation of copper deficiency, the, one of the earliest signs is neutropenia. So you order a lab test or a lab panel in this case called a CBC or a complete blood count with differential and the differential is we're looking at different subsets of white blood cells. One of those subsets are called neutrophils. If a person becomes copper deficient, those neutrophils start to lower. That's a sign of copper deficiency, and we call that neutropenia. That's one of the earlier signs, not necessarily of zinc toxicity, but rather zinc-induced copper deficiency. Uh, from the doses that I typically recommend for zinc, let's say 30 to 50 milligrams, no one's going to get toxic from that, except under the most unusual circumstances that I have no idea what those circumstances would be, and I've been studying this for 25 years and went to several graduate programs. So I've never heard of, never, I have never heard of zinc toxicity from a reasonable clinical dose. What's the clinical presentation of selenium toxicity? This is one that we should reasonably know. You're probably not going to see it in your clinical practice, but you should at least know what it is. So most of those patients present with diarrhea, fatigue, hair loss, joint pain, changes in their nails, changes in the color and or like weakness of their nails, nausea. Now you'll see that those are very non-specific manifestations. Some of those actually look kind of like vitamin D toxicity. We've got weakness, we've got fatigue, we've got hair loss with vitamin A toxicity as well. We've got joint pain with vitamin A toxicity. Uh, not so much the changes in the nails and nausea. We could see that with vitamin D toxicity and vitamin A toxicity. So the only thing that's unique about selenium toxicity is the characteristic of a sulfur odor or a sulfur taste in the mouth. And a lot of times that's referred to as garlic breath. That's relatively specific for selenium toxicity. Uh, I don't think we see that with any other toxic manifestation of other diseases. With some supplements, uh, we can see kind of that garlicky taste, but that's not toxicity. Here we're talking about toxicity. If someone's using DMSA, for example, uh, they may have a sulfur taste in their mouth or the odor as the capsules open up in their stomach. But that's, that's not what we're talking about here. That's, that's normal. That's physiologic. Here we're talking about toxicity, and specifically it's known as garlic breath. So then we have to follow that up with lab tests. So we look at a serum selenium level, and we want that to be below 125 micrograms per liter. Obviously, different labs have different units and different reference ranges, but this is a commonly accepted and published reference range. It should be below 125 micrograms per liter. That's how we would assess for selenium toxicity. In addition, we of course would look at uh, their history. But let's say a patient, let's say that you as a clinician, you're treating your patient and they go to another vendor, they go abroad, they buy another product. Uh, and this has happened, this is reported in the research, uh, in biomedical research generally. Uh, if a patient takes a misbranded or misformulated selenium product, they can end up with selenium toxicity. So you, of course, as a clinician, especially if you're educated in, in let's say, for example, this protocol at the very least, you, of course, would never put them on a high dose enough to get toxicity. Uh, even at the higher ranges that I discuss in my protocol, you're probably not going to see toxicity there. Uh, but you do have to be aware of it. It is a possibility a patient could accidentally overdose. Maybe someone plays a trick on them and puts all their pills in a blender or something, who knows, uh, and then they come in with toxicity. You'd still, as a competent clinician, you would want to know 
what are the manifestations. They're obviously non-specific. The only one that's kind of specific is the garlic breath. So you could say, hey, why don't we run a serum uh, selenium just to make sure we don't encounter a problem here. And you would want it to be below 125 micrograms per liter. So moving on now, we've talked about vitamin D, vitamin A, you've got to be careful with vitamin A, zinc, I'm not too concerned about that. Selenium, very rarely would you ever see a problem there. You're not going to see selenium toxicity from a reasonable therapeutic dose of selenium. With uh, N-acetylcysteine, I'm talking about oral supplementation here. I'm not talking about intravenous administration. That's a, a different ballgame. The toxicity of NAC is what? Is zero. So no toxicity from nutritional oral doses. Intravenous, like I said, that's a different ball game. Sometimes patients can go into anaphylaxis, cardiac arrest. Sometimes patients with asthma can have exacerbation of their asthma, probably due to the liberation of the sulfur from the cysteine, because sulfur, a lot of, some patients don't tolerate sulfur, and sulfites, uh, which are derivatives of sulfur-containing compounds, can be pro-inflammatory, independent of any allergy. So we might be a little concerned or at least aware of the fact that a patient could, just like with any type of sulfur, they could, uh, if they already have asthma, they might become a little more uh, asthmatic. So we'd be aware of that. That's not really toxicity, though. That's just sulfur intolerance. So laboratory, we don't, we don't concern ourselves with NAC toxicity. It's used in cases of toxicity, obviously. However, uh, NAC has the ability to chelate minerals, and so you might see, with long-term high-dose supplementation, you could possibly see mineral deficiencies like copper or zinc. Just be aware of that possibility. Uh, I don't think that you're going to see that clinically. What is the toxicity of glycyrrhizin? So glycyrrhizin is the active component of licorice root. If people make a tea of licorice root, the average dose of glycyrrhizin is what? The average dose of glycyrrhizin is 32 milligrams per cup. That is a therapeutic dose in one cup of tea. It's also potentially a toxic dose. If a patient consumes one cup of licorice tea per day and they consume, let's say, 32 milligrams of glycyrrhizin, within one or two weeks, some patients could become depleted of potassium and potentially they could become hypertensive as well. So what is the toxicity of glycyrrhizin? For, some, for most patients, it's nothing. For others, they develop what's called pseudo-aldosterone syndrome or pseudo-aldosteronism, and their presentation is weakness due to potassium depletion and a hypertensive headache. The way that you diagnose hypertension is by taking their blood pressure, measuring their blood pressure in the office, and then we measure hypokalemia. That's a lab test looking at their potassium levels. If they are hypertensive and potassium depleted, and they've been either taking a licorice supplement or licorice tea or licorice candy, then we put that clinical picture together and say, wow, this starts to look like pseudoaldosteronism. Let's back off the licorice for a while, make sure they increase their intake of potassium, or if it's really low, then of course they would need to get that um, kind of medically or pharmacologically. Most patients do not consume an adequate amount of potassium. So we should, nutritionally speaking, medically speaking, we should have most of our patients either on a relatively higher potassium diet or a potassium supplement. So the recommended intake for potassium for adults is 4.7 grams per day, 4.7 grams per day. Only 10% of adults actually reach that. Most patients and people don't because they're not consuming enough fruits and vegetables. So 4.7 grams per day is the recommended intake of potassium. Only 10% get there, 90% don't. So if you're working with a patient who's in that 90% of borderline potassium depletion or borderline potassium intake, and now you put them on glycyrrhizin, yes, you could induce hypokalemia in them. I don't think it's too common. And I'm not personally overly concerned about it, but it is a possibility. If someone overconsumes licorice, so let's say that you, you as a clinician or a clinician, let's say that a clinician fails to advise their patient appropriately, and they say, "Oh, I want you to take licorice tea for your herpes or licorice tea for your hepatitis, viral hepatitis or whatever." That's inappropriate, and that's not really professional 
level behavior in terms of prescribing. When we prescribe nutrition, just like when we prescribe drugs, we have to tell patients the dose, how often to take it, and the duration of how long, this, these are just the minimum, the, the duration for how long they're going to take it. You'll notice that most prescription drugs uh, come with a prescription. And the prescription always includes a limitation. It's a limitation on duration and the number of pills taken per day. Really clear instructions. So that's one of the good things that they do or we do in the medical world is prescription drugs come with certain parameters that are well-defined. Uh, a lot of times we need to use the same parameters when we're prescribing nutrition. So I need you to take this product, not any product off the shelf. I need you to take this product this many times per day for this many weeks and then you stop and you don't keep taking this for the rest of your life. So I learned that really early in my clinical practice when I saw a patient who had a viral infection, interestingly enough, and this was when I was still developing my clinical practice. I was relatively uh, young at the game at the time and I put her on a high dose of vitamin A, maybe 100,000 units, I don't recall what it was. But here's what happened is she came back six months later with headache. So she was developing some vitamin A toxicity because she had continued to take the vitamin A. Now that's not entirely her fault. I'm the one who told her to take it because again, being young in my career at that time, I didn't tell her, you're only taking high dose vitamin A while you're sick. This is only gonna be for five to seven, 10 days at the most, not six months. So she taught me or I learned through that experience that anytime we prescribe nutrition, we also have to prescribe the limits so it, that's, you know, that's what makes it a parameter. It has a start and it has an end. And then the insides of that is the daily dosage, but it also includes our monitoring of their situation. So I hope that this was helpful. These are some of the risks that I think we need to be aware of. This obviously isn't the entire antiviral protocol. These are just representative examples of clinical presentations and laboratory findings that I think we all need to be aware of as we implement an antiviral, or in this case, my antiviral nutrition protocol. So thank you very much for your attention and I hope you enjoyed this video.